is not going to go well. Another knockdown. The Flat Earthers versus the Globeheads. The following is an opinion on the theories at the heart of the Flat Earth debate. Newton's gravity is the big hinge in the Flat Earth debate and pivot of the Flat Earth theory that people of influence have conspired over the centuries to elevate Newton and his fellow Anglo-Saxon alumni to the status of gurus, blessed with the knowledge to answer the most mysterious questions about creation itself. For more than 320 years, Newton's law of universal gravitation has been the glue holding everything together for the currently accepted view of the universe and how it all works. Since 1687, Newton's theory of an inverse square law based on the mass of objects attracting each other over distances has been commonly accepted as how planets manage to orbit stars and moons orbit planets without smashing into each other. With a bit of help from Einstein later on, Newton's theory of universal gravitation allowed for the idea that the Earth is just another globe orbiting the Sun along with the other round planets or wandering stars, each of them vastly different in mass yet miraculously spinning at just the right speed at just the right distance from each other billions of years after being blasted in all directions by the Big Bang. The Big Bang and Newton's gravity based on mass is the mainstay theory touted as fact by conventional institutionalized science, or more precisely, theoretical physics, to explain the reason for our very existence. Despite the dependence on Newton's idea of mass creating gravity to literally make the world go round, the theory has never ever properly been put to the test. It has never been repeated in a scientific experiment here on Earth or in space. Never in the history of scientific experimentation has a spinning ball attracted or repelled another spinning ball because of a difference in the speed and mass of the individual balls suspended unaided in space. However, there are alternative theories that could easily replace Newton's so-called laws. They are easily observable and repeatable and would seem to adequately describe the mechanics of the cosmic machine we live in, combining the properties of density, buoyancy, temperature, electricity and magnetism. Mass, after all, is just another way to describe an object's density. Here's just one example of an alternative to Newton's theories that can be repeatedly tested and observed right here on Earth. 97 years after Newton's theories on universal gravitation were first published, French physicist Charles Augustin de Coulomb came out with his laws of electrostatic interaction, which are said to be an essential part of the theory of electromagnetism by describing the interaction between electrically charged particles. Coulomb's law was first published in 1784. It is an inverse square law similar to Isaac Newton's law of universal gravitation. The difference is that Coulomb's law has been tested heavily, resulting in all observations upholding the law's principle. The electromagnetic spectrum comprises much of the frequencies and waves we see, sense and experience. Gamma rays, X-rays, ultraviolet light, visible light, infrared, microwaves, radio waves and extremely low frequencies or ELFs are all part of it. Yet it is the studies and work in the occult of Freemason Sir Isaac Newton that have been assigned as the official status quo of the cosmos. As well as alchemy, Newton focused on biblical interpretation, especially of the apocalypse, developing a Newtonian worldview that has the cosmos as a purely mechanical machine with a violent beginning and end. Newton's status in history is not only for his thought experiments as a scientist. He was a member of the Parliament of England for Cambridge University and was later made warden of the Royal Mint a position he obtained through the patronage of Charles Montagu, the first Earl of Halifax and then Chancellor of the Exchequer. Newton was in charge of England's finances during the country's great recoining, 
hunting down counterfeiters to have them hanged, drawn and quartered by frequenting taverns and bars to gather the evidence himself. In under two years, between 1698 and 1699, Newton is said to have prosecuted 28 coiners with more than 100 cross-examinations of witnesses, informers and suspects. As a result of Newton's recommendations, Britain moved for the first time from the silver standard to a gold standard. Newton was made president of the Royal Society in 1703 and knighted by Queen Anne two years later in 1705, making him the second scientist to be knighted after Sir Francis Bacon. Sir Isaac Newton's personal coat of arms was a pair of white crossed bones on a black background. Ironic that he was an investor in the South Sea Company, officially the governor and company of the merchants of Great Britain trading to the South Seas and other parts of America, created in 1711 as a public-private partnership to consolidate and reduce the cost of national debt, while allegedly profiting from the slave trade and insider trading. According to Wikipedia, the shareholders used their advanced knowledge of when national debt was to be consolidated to make large profits from purchasing debt in advance. Huge bribes were given to politicians to support the acts of parliament necessary for the scheme, it is believed. After a run of massive profits, peaking in 1720, the company collapsed spectacularly, causing what economists refer to as the South Sea Bubble. When the bubble burst, the national economy was shattered along with it. Yet the South Sea Company was restructured and continued to operate for more than a century after the historical financial disaster from its headquarters in Threadneedle Street at the heart of the financial district in London. On the same street, the Bank of England now sits today. Newton is said to have lost heavily when the South Sea Company collapsed. So, it is not only science for which Newton's name is synonymous. He was a political figure and investment banker, after whom many of the world's most influential educational institutions have been named, including the Isaac Newton University Lodge for Cambridge University alumni and those of university lodges all over the world. Newton's laws, not only in theoretical physics, but in the world of politics, have governed entire generations of conventional mainstream science and the funding of it, without a single earthbound experiment to prove beyond a doubt that his theories about gravity are actually true. This institutionalized adherence to a branch of science to explain our existence, conceived by such an influential man whose belief in a robotic interpretation of the word of God has been so widely and frequently preached that it has eclipsed and suffocated all other world views in Western science for centuries. Aside from the requirement for generations of scientists to accept Newton's religious views as the answer to the origins of life, his theories have been kept alive to this day by a single event in history, man walking on the moon. The Apollo missions to the moon are the single most important observations of Newton's theories in action. It is the grainy black and white images of men in spacesuits bouncing around in low gravity on the surface of a dusty moon 50 years ago that has solidified the notion that Newton was right in the mind's eye of the general public and the science community that we have been persuaded to have absolute faith in. After more than three centuries, it was Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins performing in the greatest TV show on Earth that turned Newton's convoluted theories defining his laws of gravity into a movie that everyone could relate to and now actually see in their heads. Astronauts bouncing about, driving dune buggies and playing golf next to an American flag and the tinfoil wrapped box they had landed in is the singularly most spectacular piece of visible proof of Newtonian physics. The moon landings proved beyond a doubt Newton's theory that your weight is relative to the mass of the heavenly body you are standing on, thereby providing evidence of the Big Bang and everything that goes with it. With so much riding on the outcome, is it beyond reasonable doubt that proving Newton was right all along was the one thing the moon missions were all about? 
Would this historical event be the shot in the arm the esteemed institutions named after Newton needed to keep up their good names? Is it possible that failure simply was not an option when it came to going to the moon and keeping alive an institutional idea of the highest significance? If, after building one of the largest and most profitable taxpayer-funded industries on the assumption that going into space required understanding of Newton's notions of physics, it was ultimately found that Newton's laws of universal gravitation were not in fact the driving force behind the workings of the universe, the moon landings would have had to have been staged, simply to keep the business of going into space a profitable one. It is pure pride of man's apparent ability to defy gravity and land on the moon and all the glory of conquering the final frontier to boldly go where no man has gone before that is the crutch of the unshakable faith that we already have the answers to life's most meaningful question. Ask yourself, if the moon landings were to fail, how much was really at stake for the elite who had invested in it? If the moon missions had never been conceived or simply not taken place, could science possibly have been taken in a multitude of other directions? Would we by now be on a completely different path to discovering our role in the universe as we know it? As always, qui bono?